So we've been getting a lot of traction on the preaching. Just how many of you have been fighting against codependency? How many have you been ruling over it? Hallelujah. Lovely to see all the hands. And I've been uh, getting lots and lots of calls and meetings about how to overcome codependency. Because we've been preaching through those five things. What does God want you to do with your life? And the first thing that we said was He wants you to have dominion. He wants you to have rulership. And we've been looking at rulership now for, for about six weeks already. All the different ways that God wants you to rule and reign and have dominion in your life. We've also looked at how to live on this earth. You know, you're supposed to live on this earth, earth like Jesus lived on this earth. They say, well, Jesus didn't have such a cool life. Actually, he did. He had an amazing life of dominion over sickness, over sin. He was one who demonstrated that second dominion mandate, which is to reveal the image of God on the earth. And then we've looked, or we're going to be looking at, as Donnie said, about work, that God has called you to work. I was in the meeting with the young adults on Thursday night, and Donnie spoke to them about how to get a job. It was amazing. Uh, I wish I had got that information when I was about 16. I was telling them my first job was loading off trucks. Um, and it wasn't so pleasant. But uh, he encouraged me even in what I did because he said, just do what God gives you to do and he'll bless you. If you'll do properly and wholeheartedly as an act of service to the Lord, what you are doing, he will bring you blessing and the next mandate, which is to have stewardship or wealth in your life. I know some people say, you know, does God really want us to be wealthy? Um, yes, he does. That's the fourth thing that he tells you to do. He says, I want you to steward or look after the things I've given you. A lot of people can't look after what they have. So it's really difficult when we go to God, we say, God, give us another one. And we're not looking after what we got. It's like the little boy who said, Daddy, I want a bike with gears on. How many of you asked your father that already? Can I get a bike with gears on? And he says, yeah, sure you can if you look after the one you've got. And that's what stewardship looks like. And then the last one, we're going to look at healthy relationships, which is described in the area of marriage. But not just marriage to your husband and wife. Do you know that God calls you to marry each other? Amen. Not have sex with each other, but to, marry, to be married to each other. You have sex with your wife, right? We all understand that. But you get married relationally to the people in and those who are around you in church. In other words, it's a level of commitment that is, you can't turn back from it. You know, God hates divorce. Amen. He really hates it. It's destructive against that fifth thing that he asks you to do, which is to be married. And some people treat the church sort of like as a girlfriend. I come and see her, and I come and see the people maybe every couple of months when I really feel like I need to sing some nice songs. Weren't those songs amazing this morning? I had to stop him because if I carry on singing, I won't have any voice left. <laughs> but unfortunately, we use church where we should be married to one another. We use it as a girlfriend, isn't it, sir? We kind of, you know, just like to check her out a little bit and see how she's doing. Yeah, girlfriends are right. And then we come back four months later. That's not marriage, right? And so God calls us to these five things. And we've been looking at some of the reasons why we fail to exercise the first one. What's the first one? I'm calling you to rule and have dominion. I'm calling you to be in charge of your life. Some people say, oh, God, whatever you tell me to do, I'll do it. It's kind of like saying, God, I can't take responsibility for my life. Have you heard that kind of speaking? I remember saying to God one time, God, you tell me what to do. You tell me where to live. He said, no, you decide you have to live there. I remember when I said, Lord, should I marry Jill? He said, I don't know. Do you want to? You have to be married to her. Amen? Amen? It's not up to God to tell you those things. It's up to you to decide through the Word of God, through the leading of the Spirit, what God wants you to do and to have rulership and dominion in that area. 
I remember my daughter said to me, she said, Dad, should I buy this house? I said, I don't know. You have to live there. Amen? And so a lot of our requests before God for guidance are really cop-outs. They cop-outs of actually making a dominion or a rulership decision in our lives. Amen? We have this false, this false sovereignty of God. You know, God is sovereign. God is over all things. But he gave dominion and rulership to mankind. Remember in the garden, I said to Adam and Eve, he said, rule over this piece of land called Eden. Now, Eden was perfect, but it was incomplete. God wanted them to expand it, to develop it. And so God calls you and I to begin to exercise rulership and dominion in those four or five areas of our life on the board there to help us be able to manifest his image and his likeness on the earth. Amen? Amen. This is what this series is all about. Let's just look quickly at where he said this to mankind. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 to 28. It says... Um, my assistant is going to put it up. Then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Do you see you made in God's image and likeness? You have the power. Adam and Eve had the power to choose. Do you know animals don't have the power to choose? They can be trained, but they work by instinct. If you ever go to the wild game park, you find that at a certain time of the year, they mate and do rutting. They can't stop themselves. Unfortunately, some men are like that. Just saying. <laughs> it's called rutting, isn't it? It's not called lovemaking. And so it says those words, we made in God's image and likeness. Because you have the power as a believer in Jesus. You have the power to choose. You have the right to choose. Do you know why you used to sin? Because you're a sinner. You know why you live righteously? Because God made you righteous. We sang about that this morning. And so he says, So that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over the livestock, all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. What that doesn't mean is that you can go skateboarding through Kruger National Park. I remember a friend of mine, she was out surfing and um, she saw a dead whale. There's a big whale deep out there. And she thought, wow, I'd like to get closer and see that. And so she paddled out to the whale. And as she got closer, this is in False Bay, there were these great big white sharks slamming into the side of the whale and taking pieces of meat off the dead whale, a southern right whale. And she said, well, I've got dominion. And the Lord said, no, you don't. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that you can go tap or pack the great white shark. Some of you, I'm still trying to get you to come and swim with me in False Bay. <laughs> and they all go like that. It's only Burger, I think, and, and Christine who's had that boldness. But it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it or rule over it. What that means is as you steward or look after the resources that God has given you, you exercise rulership or dominion on the earth. Rulership comes through stewarding. It comes through looking after things that God has entrusted to you. Think about it. You were, how many of you were given children to look after? Do you understand? That is a massive sign of your dominion. You were God entrusted you. How many of you got the fright of your life when that baby came along and you didn't even have a license? You didn't have to write a test? 
There's no, nobody gave you that. They just, you know, you, you get all those books and it tells you what to do. And you're like, they didn't tell me what to do. When you change in the nappy and he's winging in your face. <laughs> See, we called to rule by the things that we steward for God. You called to rule and reign in this life. As you look after, as you men care for your wives. As your wives submit and help meet your husbands. By that stewardship, you exercise this rule and dominion on the earth. You live as a person under God's word. In a place, in a place yeah, in Gauteng, where you say, God, I'm going to live according to your word. And you begin to exercise this dominion around you. People will actually come to you because they want you to. Show how to live life. That's one of the worst things about the church, isn't it? We come to church and we're like, thank you, Jesus, that you've done all these things for us. But we really look unhappy. It doesn't look like we are ruling, does it? And so we become a poor advertisement for the call of God. Now, this thing was given to mankind, was given to Adam and Eve right in the beginning. But we find out that a couple of things in the story prevent man from ruling. We find out that he gets tempted. And you know, it's easy to blame the devil, isn't it? You say, well, it's the devil's fault. How many of you ever said that? Okay, it's good to blame the devil, but it's better to realize that Adam and Eve actually committed an act of high treason. They passed the rulership of God on their lives. They passed it over to the enemy. The devil couldn't make them do that. You know, in the 1960s, there was a trial in America where a man who was a mass murderer killed people. And his defense was, the devil made me do it. And so they called a famous evangelist, preacher, Bible teacher by the name of Lester Summerall in. And he stood up in the door, in the dock, and he used this scripture. He said, he said, the devil can't make any human being do something. You have to willingly give over to him. Do you understand that? You have a free will. You have an ability to choose. God has given that to us. When the Spirit of God convicts us and moves us in our heart, we respond by accepting Jesus. How many of you have didn't have done that? God moved on your heart, convinced you through the power of the Spirit, and then gave you that ability to respond to the gospel and receive Jesus. But we find out that because of this fall, we're going to read about the fall. Let's just read about it in Genesis 3 and verse 6. It says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made covering for themselves. I want you to get this next verse. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9. Here it is. But the Lord God called to the man. Everybody say man. And he said, where are you? Look at verse 10. He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I, so I hid. Verse 11. Then God said, Who told you? Can you see that you there? That's you, Adam. Not you, Adam and Eve. He said, Who told you, Adam? You see, here's the deal, guys. When all of the problems started, it was because Adam and Eve... We're in the garden. But when the snake came, what happened to Adam? Adam went to sleep. 
You see, you can't have, listen to me carefully, you can't have dominion in your life if your husband, listen carefully ladies, so blame the men, if your husbands are spiritually passive. You know, men come to church but kind of hang out in the back on their phones all the time. Because what happens is the men became passive. This all started because the head of the family, the head of the union between the man and the woman, one of them became passive. One of them said, you know what, wife, you decide. Can you see what it says? When they came together, they ate, but the man allowed it. See, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11 that the man is the head of the wife. That's how it works. If you're in an environment at home where the man, the husband, is passive spiritually, you will struggle to exercise dominion and rulership in your life. That's what this, this preach is all about. See, men have this problem, don't we? We have this difficult. Can you see verse, well, it's not up there, but I'm going to tell you verse 9, or uh, there it is. Verse 9, God called to the man. He said, hey, where are you? It wasn't because God had lost him, you know. Oh, he's somewhere here in the garden. <laughs> no, he's calling to the man because the man was created first. The man was created first. Then verse 11. Who told you, not you plural, not you all, but you specifically, you Adam. What was the man's response? Let's look at verse 12. What did the man say when God spoke this to him? He said, God's not really my fault yet. Whose fault is this? It's the woman. It's the wo now, actually, it's not really the woman's fault. Whose fault really is this? Can you see what it says? You gave her to me. She, she's the one that you gave to me. Actually, God. God. It, you made me marry her. It's actually her fault. Now dominion, listen to me carefully, dominion in the household, rulership in the household, exercising rulership cannot be achieved, cannot be accomplished, cannot be received, cannot be walked consistently in unless the man takes spiritual leadership of his home. Amen? Woman, don't look so relieved. Because you have a responsibility as well. The Bible will tell us. In fact, next week we're going to speak about the woman's responsibility. Men, make sure you bring your wives to church next week. Amen? I would recommend you do that. Because today we're going to talk to the men. We're going to talk to the mighty men. I want to read you a statistic. Let me read you this statistic. South Africa has one of the highest rates of absent fathers in sub-Sahara Africa. And according to released figures of the register of birth occurrences in South Africa, 62% of births have no father's details in the birth register. 62%. Do you know, in the system of apartheid, we removed the men from the families. It was a demonic ploy to destroy this generation. We have much to repent of because of what we did with our fathers. Now, the problem is our fathers are passive. Our fathers don't know how to pray and they don't know how to read and study the Bible. 
And so in statistics, in the revelation of what's actually going on in, our South, in South Africa. See, people are trying to change the economy. How many of you have seen the drive by our president to create jobs? It's useless if there are no fathers present. It's useless. Fathers distinguish the children in what God has called them to do. Let me read you another couple of statistics. They're really, really bad. It's, it's horrendous. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 63%. I was at a funeral a couple of weeks ago. And all of the pictures of this young man's funeral, the father wasn't mentioned once. And this man had committed suicide. Listen to me, 63% of youth suicides are because there's no father present. 90%, listen to this statistic. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 90%. Where there's an average of 32% where there are fathers in the homes. 85% of all children who show behavior disorder come from fatherless homes. 20 times the average. So you older fathers, let me tell you what your responsibility is. Because I'm not, a fa I'm not a father anymore. I'm more a grandfather. My responsibility, your responsibility, if you're an older person there and, you, and you're sitting there going, well, I didn't do too bad. My children aren't mass murderers. What's your job? Your job is to teach the children and the grandchildren how to study the Bible and read and pray. Amen? It's very specific. It's very specific. The last book of Malachi said, unless the fathers start to do this, God puts a curse on our land. How many of you can see how cursed our country is? Why is it cursed? Well, because we've got some of the highest statistics in unemployment in the world with the kinds of resources we have. I was driving here with Johan this morning and he said, John, I, he had a dream last night and it was all about finance and trade and all those things. He said, I've heard that the Joburg or Gauteng has all the money as opposed to Cape Town. You all know this to be true. There's no money. If anybody wants to, if people, I want to move to Cape Town. There's no money in Cape Town. <laughs> only thing, that, they only have super expensive things like property. Or everything for free, like the beach. <laughs> but the money's here. So how come we, he asked me, he said, why is the money all here? And I said, because we have a history of mining and agriculture focused in this part of the country. But the reality is without fathers teaching their children without fathers being present, without fathers stop blaming, your children can never have dominion, especially in what Donnie was talking about in the workplace. There's nothing worse. And if we had to ask those who employ people today, as the generation that's coming through, that all want to be techie billionaires overnight without doing too much work. Amen? <laughs> uh, I don't want to blame the millennials here, but here it comes. I sat with the principal of the school, and, I, and he, had, he met with all the grandparents. And he says, listen, grandparents, the problem is you raised a bunch of millennials. He said, they can't work. They don't know how to work. They give up so easily. If they don't become a YouTube sensation overnight, they give up. 
My, my, my. What happened to the fathers? What happened to the husbands? Come on now. Amen. Look what it says. What are husbands or what do husbands and fathers do? Number one, they love their wives. And by so doing, teach their children how to honor women. Amen. Do you know that South Africa has the highest in marriage rape statistics in the world? In the marriage. Because fathers, husbands, didn't teach the children how to love their mothers, their, their wives. Amen? The Bible tells us, us this. It says, husbands, love your wives. I, one, of the, my favorites, one of my favorite moments down with my grandchildren and with my son-in-law was when I heard my son-in-law say this to his son, my grandson, my oldest grandson, Hunter. Don't talk to her like that. That's my wife, not yours. Hallelujah. I thought, yes, Jesus. We got something going on here. Amen? Now, he wasn't ugly. He just said to him, boy, don't speak to your mom like that. That's my wife, not your wife. Amen? What else do... Fathers and husbands do. They set the moral and the ethical compass in the family. By so doing, they remove the curse off the land. Let me say that again. Husbands and fathers set the morals of the family and the ethics of the family. That's why husbands have to be seen Always to be faithful to their one wife. Maybe the most tragic thing today is seeing the amount of unfaithfulness there is. Aren't you glad for a happy marriage? Faithfulness to your wives. Because by so doing, you set the moral and the ethical compass of your family. Morals. What is right and what is wrong? Are you allowed to tell somebody what's right and what's wrong? You know, I always say this to the young woman. Let me say this to you, young woman. Don't go for a man. Or, or th This is what I recommend you do. You, you young girls, Haley, listen to this one, because this is specifically for you. All the young ladies. L go and see if the guy that you're going out, their father, is a Bible person and a prayer. Amen? It's the best advice I can give you. Go and find out if, the f if your future father-in-law is a church person. Not church, sit at the back, wait till get, get out of the service. But go and find out if the person that you're going to marry, the father of that, that guy, is a person of the word and a person of prayer. Because unfortunately... I know this. I have three daughters. They all went for the guys with the fast cars and the slick looks. <laughs> and I used to say to them, babies, listen to me now. Look for the guys whose fathers love Jesus. Best bit of advice. Just like Donnie's advice he gave to you about work. That's the best bit of advice you can get. Look for those ones. You know, if you, you don't even have to look. They'll come to you. Because the best ones who've been taught that by their fathers, they come looking for you. They don't expect you to go looking for them. Come on. Amen. amen. Say amen. Or, Ouch, this is hurting. Hallelujah. <laughs> look for the fathers of your boyfriends, of your future husbands. And see if they people of the word and people of prayer. You'll have a happy life. You'll have a happy life. Number three, what do fathers and husbands do? Fathers and husbands are present. You know what I mean by present? I'm saying this one because most fathers and husbands are checked out when they're with their children. You know how we check out? 
I don't have my phone with me. This is my giant cell phone. <laughs> Hello, my boy. How are you doing? I have to see what's happening on News 24. Yes, you're such a... Wee -wee -wee -wee. <laughs> Actually, I can see the price of wheat went down. And then it's like stupid stuff. It's like gossip stuff. Jill and I have had to speak to our son-in-laws about this. Because all the time that you're not present, your children can't be formed by your presence. Most people are so distracted today by the media of the telephone. It's like, so what? It doesn't matter what Do Donald Trump said. It's like somebody wants to always tell me what Donald... I said, I don't care. My, my, my one daughter, she's always trying to tell me what Sora Ramaphosa said. I said, I don't care. You know why? Because he's got that much influence on my life. I live under another president. And so should he. When you are checked out, can you see that th the third one? Make sure you are present. And active as a father in teaching your children, in, in leading your, your wife. Because then you're going to establish, you men have this power. You establish an environment for dominion, for your children to exercise dominion. You have that power, you have that ability, you have that strength. Men, women can't really do that. You know, people say to me, John, but, you know, woman can't they? The woman can't be an elder in this church unless her husband agrees with that. You all know that. We're going to ordain woman elders in this church because we believe in it. But we would never usurp as the church the authority of men in their homes. For those of you sitting there, woman, let me say this to you. Faith and unity is created, generated, stimulated because of the man that you married to. Amen? That fourth thing that you must do as a man. Be the person who keeps the family in unity. I unfortunately grew up in a home where my mom modeled spirituality for me. I remember sneaking. Have you ever done that? You kind of, they think you're sleeping in your room and you open. I had a system. I took off the burglar bars. I could swing them back. Jump out the window. And go on the jaw. I thought it was very clever. And I used to come sneaking in in the nighttime because I, I had to close the window and sometimes the latch would fall. So I had to come through the front door. Where we lived, we never, we never really locked the front door. Shows you my, how old I am. And so, and so I, used to, I remember I used to sneak past my parents' room. And what I used to hear was my mother calling out to God for my salvation. I thought I was really clever. She knew where I was. She knew where I was. God had shown her many times. But you know what the sad part was? That my father never went to church. It's the saddest thing that I have in my life. I had to try and draw from the spirituality, and I thank God for my spiritual mother. But oh, how much better it would be if I snuck past that room and I heard my father crying out to God for my salvation. All the most successful men that I know in life, all of them, all of them, had active fathers, or somebody who took them up as a spiritual son. They said, I'll look after you. I'll care for you. I'll show you how to follow Jesus. I'll model following Jesus for you. So this is a challenge for the men today. Woman next week. Woman next week. This is the challenge for you men. Now some of you might be sitting there and feeling a bit despondent. You say, wow, well, you know what I... I I kind of missed it with my children. How many of you would like to have another shot? Another opportunity? Hmm? 
Well, you can't. <laughs> but what you can do is you can teach those younger people around you through modeling, through the choices you make, to choose spiritual men, men who are men of prayer and the word, so that those watching you, remember, older people, people are watching you, the young people are watching you. Model for them. Model for them. I always say this to women, you know, particularly one woman, she always comes to me and says, my husband doesn't like me going to church. And I say, which one are you going to obey? Your husband Jesus or your husband at home? Now, I'm not trying to cause problems in the home, but I know this to be true. That for many years, my father was angry. I'm talking about break furniture angry. That she would say, I'm going to church. I remember one man, a close friend of mine, who had a great big electrical company. Huge electrical business. Multi-millionaire. He phoned me up one day. We became, we became close friends. He phoned me up one day. He said to me, John, please come and speak to my daughter. She just doesn't want to go to church. And I said, my brother... The reason why she doesn't go to church is because she never sees you go to church. Remember, even though your children are grown up now, you have grandchildren or you have the younger children around you, let them see your choices. Let them see you choose the ways of Christ, the ways of God. Let them see that you choose to be a person of prayer, a man of prayer, a man of the word. And if you don't know how to do it, you just have to model it. This is how you live your life as you make the choices. God's made it really easy for us, isn't it? And that he said you could come together and learn the Bible together. My poor friend, he was, he was absolutely distraught. He said to me, John, I don't know how I'm going to get my daughter to follow Jesus. She's taken up with some fast guys, with fast cars and really good looks. And I've lost my influence. You start to lose your influence real early, guys. Now I'm telling you, how do you turn this around? By starting to be an example to the young people who are around you. Start to make the choices. And by so doing, create an environment where the next generation, that one following after us, can live in a culture of dominion and rulership. Amen. Let's the men stand up. And if you have your wife around you, I want your wife to take her hand and put it in your back. Do you know what the Bible says? The wife is the helpmeet. Do you know what the word helpmeet means? Donnie, just come over here. If, Donnie, if I'm the wife and Donnie's the man, don't go there, okay? Just <coughs> I'll have the LGBT, whatever it's called on my case. <coughs> so this is what the word wife means when it says you are the helpmeet of your husband. It says that you surround them. Like a roaring lion, like that lioness. And you hold them up. You hold them up. Do you know it's not the man's job to hold up? You know it's a woman's job to hold up? To stand there and hold you up. To hold you up in prayer. That's why the woman, if you were here with your husband, okay, I want you to take your hand, put it behind his back like that. And hold him up. Make him stand on his toes. To remind him, my darling, I'm there to hold you up. If your wife isn't here, thanks, but If your wife isn't here, why is she not here? Come on now. Amen? Help her through a Matthew 18. Help her. Say, come on, my dear. I'm going to make you breakfast in bed. So you get up extra early to come with me. But let's pray for the men who are standing and the wives who are the helpmeets. 
Catherine came up and she's helped meeting with Babaki over the, over the other shoulder. Praise God for that. Come on, man, let's receive from God. Father, we pray now. I ask you for these men who are, who are, who are men of courage to create an v- environment where their wives and their children, their grandchildren, can exercise dominion and rule in this life. In the name of Jesus. I pray for these men that they will not only be physical fathers, but they will become spiritual fathers, spiritual leaders, spiritual examples. I pray for each man who stand in here this morning. Make them the leaders that you call them to be. Set them up, Lord. Set them up in this life. Set them up, Jesus, by your spirit. Set them up in their dominion. Set them up in their multiplication of the image in the children and in the grandchildren. Set them up, Lord, in their work situations. Promote them. Give them open doors, Lord. Let them, through their faithfulness, be given more to steward in this life. Set them up, Father. In this church, I pray there will be healthy, healthy, healthy marriages. Even as last week, we drove out the spirit of blame and codependency in the name of Jesus. We banish that spirit from our households and from our homes in the name of Jesus. We lift up these men, Lord. We lift up the men who haven't got wives yet. We pray, Father, that they will learn from their spiritual parents and from their biological parents who are here how to be spiritual leaders, spiritual giants in the land. Come on, men, I want you to pray for South Africa now. You, you hold this position of authority. Let's pray for our fatherless generation. And another woman can pray as well, but let us men say, God, send us fathers, Lord. Change this around. Change this around. We ask you and we pray. Come on, fathers. Don't be passive. Don't be passive. Ask the Lord. Petition the Father. Say, Father, send us Father. Raise up fathers, Lord. Break the culture of a fatherless society in a fatherless country. Set us free from this, Lord. Set us free from this. Where there's a culture of absentee fathers. fathers, I pray you'd give these men a voice, Lord. To speak up and say, that's not God's will. I pray this, that you'd give them that voice, Lord. As they live out this example of what it means to be a father. We ask you this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord.